Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Devin from Devin Talks Tabletop. I'm a friendly neighborhood board gamer. This is the YouTube channel where what I say doesn't matter and the games are made up. And I flip that around, but a lot of things are going to get flipped. Like, for the fact that I actually have good camera quality. Because it's not me. It's Jesse. Jesse's here. <laughs> he's not going to talk. I'm going to talk. But he's going to do all the heavy lifting, which means he's going to make this look nice. And I just get to be here, which is nice. All of you have wanted, uh, not all of you, but enough of you have asked for a review or look at my whole collection to where you could get a sense of the games that I have. And since I'm not buying games for 12 months, sort of, this is what I have to work with. So we're going to see if it's going to be good enough to last me the whole time. We'll start over here at the Entertainment Center. Sometimes these games are covered up because I have this open and I'm using my TV for whatever reason. But these are stuff that are typically housed in these shelves here. I'm going to start at the bottom. This is some of the stuff that I got when I was at Gamma, pretty much. So I got Wonderland's War. This is the retail version of the game. I really enjoyed this. I did a playthrough on Play the Game with Kids Planning. Had a blast. Matt Felici taught me this. Really enjoyed it. I've got Chronicles of Crime 1900 and 2400 over there in one of the crates that I use to bring to and from the studio space that I have. I have 1400, so I haven't opened these ones yet because I've been playing through that. I've got one more case on that before I'm going to start jumping into these. And then most recently added to this section is the Horizon the board game, which I've been playing Horizon Forbidden West on my PS4 and been enjoying that a lot, so I'm excited to jump into this. I played it once with Jesse and Alex, but I'm excited to explore it more and kind of see what some of the people in the community, how they've house ruled it to make it as fun as possible for themselves. And then hidden under there, I've got this Tales from the Loop, which is a uh, RPG experience. I've also got the physical game here, which I've played about two thirds of a game and really enjoyed this. This is from Free League, which are some of my favorite um, RPG people. And then I've got Core Quest here, which I'm really excited. Uh, I got this so I could specifically jump into this with Avery, my eight-year-old, and I'm excited to do that at some point. I haven't really taught him or opened up the game to learn it myself, but I know that he'll enjoy that to kind of do a little dungeon crawl adventure experience. Then I've got So You've Been Eaten, which I really enjoyed. Scott Alms has done a lot of solo play games, and this is one that I was curious about, especially because it's so quirky that they designed a way to have nobody play it and the game just play itself. And then I've got Shadow Planet, which is from Galacta. This was a Kickstarter that just recently uh, delivered a couple months ago. And under here, I've got Destinies, which I wanted to grab after doing Dark Quarter with Jesse and Shira because I really enjoyed that. So I wanted to check out Destinies. And then I've got a little bit more stuff from Tales from the Loop and the base game and the expansions for It's a Wonderful World. I really liked playing this. I played it at two player my first time and I'm excited to check out the expansions at some point. So now I'm gonna get up off of my knees and talk about other stuff in my collection. Over here I've got my full set of Everdell. I really enjoy this. Worker placement games are big favorites of mine. I will probably at some point get rid of the Belfair expansion because it's kind of modular and just adds a few things here or there. It doesn't really have a cohesive narrative of what it adds to the game, so I don't really feel like I'll need it. But I really enjoy Spirecrest and Pearlbrook. They're both good for different reasons, and I think they're both worth keeping. If I had to pick one, probably be Spirecrest, but I really enjoy Everdell. Can't wait for the full collection experience to come out. I've got some small box games here. The Mind, which will probably leave at some point. It's kind of just an interesting game to learn with people and different people than you play with each time because it's learning. I'm not going to ruin that. You're, you're, it's supposed to be an experience you'll learn. And then this is the only love letter game that I've kept because I absolutely love Archer. I honestly have thought about going back and rewatching the whole series at some point, but I definitely want to... It's the only love letter game I have. I got rid of the original. I got rid of the Marvel version where I let Avery keep it as his game. And then most recently I got, this is a game I play with my son, Borderlands Tiny Tina's Robot Tea Party. It is a skinned version of a Borderlands version of one of the games that uh, they already have at XYZ Game Labs. And then of course I have a kid-friendly visual version and the traditional version of Airland and Sea. I may get rid of this version at some point because I just kind of like the more thematically unique or regular Airland and Sea styled art and I want to get the lies, spies, and supplies or spies, lies, and supplies. The new one that's out that's standalone as well. I can't wait to get that. 
And then right next to these small box games, I've got both big box seasons of Dice Thrones. This is one of my favorite two-player games. I mean, I also enjoyed it four-player, though you have to have the right four-player group because it's not how I would introduce the game. I'd introduce it at two-player, but I really love this game, and I've got the Dice Throne Adventures box that can go with both of these seasons, and I've got Marvel coming on the way. So Marvel Dice Throne is on the way, too. Really excited about that, but I just I love Dice Throne. Those things aren't leaving anytime soon. And then once you go up to the next shelf, I've got some games that I have not played yet up here. So I've played a few in The Cursed, which is from Rock Manor Games. And this is kind of a deck building sandbox adventure in the Few and Cursed graphic novel world. I love the artwork in this. And it's got a lot of clever, fun, ex like it's, it's just fun to play, which I don't always think about. There's some games I play where I'm like, that was exciting or that was interesting and engaging mentally, but it wasn't just fun. And this was really fun. And I've got the expansion tucked in here too, and I kind of want to give it another play now that I've got some more people in the area that I typically play games with. Right under there is Black Orchestra, which is one of my favorite from Starling Games. It's a really, really good, tense narrative experience, and you're trying to take down Hitler as kind of resistance people within the regime of the Nazi regime in World War II. Really, really tense and satisfying gameplay. I like it. I haven't played it in quite a while, but I really enjoyed it. I've got The Loop, which I haven't played yet, but I bought that whenever there was a sale on Pandasaurus, and I bought it, I think, along with That Time You Killed Me, which I really enjoy as a two-player abstract where you have the past, the present, and the future, and you move between those timelines. And there's little modules that you add in expansions that change up the game, which I enjoy, and I've, I think I've done one out of the three modules extras, or maybe two of the three. Really like that, though. And then you've got The Godfather, which this is not... This is harder to find, and I found this at PAX Unplugged in one of the like used board games areas. So I purchased this because I've heard people say it's their favorite Eric Lang game, and it's worker placement, I think, as well, and I really enjoy worker placement, and I'm always excited to check out something that is pretty bare bones or simplistic compared to a lot of games I have, but that is reputable and people like it a lot. And then Guildmaster is kind of... A, it's one that I think a lot of people don't know about because it came out during the pandemic, but it's very much a group game where it's in the vein of games like Lords of Waterdeep, and there's a lot of player negotiation, social contract stuff that's going on while you're trying to build your own adventurer set that's got the most points that you're going for in completing contracts or missions. I like it a lot, and I thought it's got a lot going for it. It's from Good Games Publishing, who also do Unfair and some other titles that I've really enjoyed. And then up here, this just recently came in. I've had a copy of Vendetta before, but this is the deluxe version that uh, Horrible Guild was able to send my way, and it's got absolutely sumptuous components. Let me see if I can get... So it's got the neoprene player mats. So this is a game that I think not enough people know about. It's within the Vampire the Masquerade universe, but it's this very taut and tension filled 30 minute area control game where you're competing at different locations in the city of Chicago and you're accruing some victims and some allies other vampires or thralls and you're trying to build up this set of power and influence in the city while also slowly growing your deck of asymmetric faction cards or clan cards and you're playing those cards on city locations to compete with other players plays really quickly, but is very deep in some of the decision space. So as I mentioned, this is Dice Throne Adventures, which goes along with my collection there. Some up here are some two-player games. I've also got my big box of Dwellings of Eldervale. I think, I think this game will go up and up and up in opinion uh, across gamers once more people get their hands on it. This is from Luke Laurie. He did this in combination with Cardboard Alchemy, and I love it. It's a, such a good game. It's like a mashup of Euro strategy and also Ameritrash or, you know, kind of more frenetic combat. I think it's awesome. It's one of my favorite games that's come out in the last three years, and I think more people should know about it for sure. But there was a lot of complaints about people who didn't like the fact that there was one box size for all of the different editions, but I don't really care. It's good enough to justify its space. Radlands from Roxley, awesome. I've got the deluxe version that's got the neoprene play mats. 
And this is a super fun little lane battler. I think I taught this to both Jesse and Alex. We had a lot of fun with it. Then you've got Caper here, two-player game from Keymaster who did Parks. And I haven't really played. I've played Caper one time when I was up in Cleveland, but I haven't played Caper Europe at all yet. Land versus Sea, which Jesse behind the camera there has a very fancy wooden box that he created for it. This is, to me, this is like a Carcassonne killer. I would. It plays really good at two and three and four player. Two and three are probably the strongest, and four is good. It's probably great, um, but you just it's a little bit more nuanced in the communication style between players. Uh, it's such a good tile lane game. It comes in a gorgeous box, fantastic art, and the components are, there's not a lot of them, and they do a lot with what they have. So land versus sea is a highlight for me. I've got unmatched here. I've played unmatched a little bit, not a lot. There's actually some of the other volumes that I'd probably like more. If I wanted, if I had the ability, I'd probably pick up Cobble and Fog because the Victorian era theme is more fitting to what I'm interested in, but I liked it and I haven't gotten rid of it yet because I want to give it more of a chance before I think about it. Then I've got Caesar, which is matched over there by Blitzkrieg, and those are amazing games by Paolo Mori. Really enjoy those. Then Seven Wonders Duel, which I can say emphatically is better than Seven Wonders, Alex. It's better than Seven Wonders because Seven Wonders is okay. Seven Wonders Duel, though, is really enjoyable. I play it on BGA sometimes, too but it's really good. And then tucked away up here, kind of hard to get to, um, but that's just because I stacked so much, is Watergate, which is a really, really good two-player game as well. Alex and I just recently posted a video where we played that while we also complained about Twilight Struggle. And then, moving on to the other shelf, we've got other stuff. This is some stuff that I kind of keep in its own section for games that I think are easy and accessible to teach to people that don't play games as much. I've got Clank, which I really think is a easygoing, fun, lighthearted deck builder. Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig, which I use as a replacement for Seven Wonders because I like the cooperative element of the simultaneous drafting where you're building castles with people left and right to you and you don't have just one of your own. I've got Deception, Murder in Hong Kong, which is one of my preferred games like Mysterium or Resistance where you've got this larger group trying to find out some information. I've got the Dark Edition of King of Tokyo, which I don't, I did not really like King of Tokyo enough to justify purchasing it. And then they came out with this version of it, which just has such gorgeous artwork. I love the dark with the yellows. And then it's even got inside of it, let me see if I can get it out. It's got such a nice board art and it's got nice little storage and really chunky dice. I'd actually say that my least favorite part of this is the dice. They're so big that people have difficulty holding all the dice in their hand, but it's still a good game. Yeah, so all of these are ones that I teach to people that don't have games. I've got Micro Macro because I think for some people that don't really think they like games but like puzzles and figuring out a mystery, I thought this was a lot of fun. I'll probably get rid of it at some point or just gift it to somebody because once you go through all the cases, there's not really a need. And this is the Parks expansion to Parks, which I think is a fantastic game to intro people into resource management and you know contract fulfillment going after those park cards and stuff like that also beautiful well organized it's got game trays in here which also dwellings of Eldervale has amazing storage in it as well if you have good storage that makes the game easier to get to I'm all about that all about that Azul which I really have just because of my son I'll probably get rid of it at some point it's not a game that I love but it's an easy one to teach to people Santorini I also have pretty much for my son. These are games that I would teach to other people but that I wouldn't personally keep in my collection. But he likes both of those so I keep them in and play them. Captain Sonar is a very niche game. It's really, I love this when it's like eight people because you have four on four and it can be an absolutely insane experience. It's like Battleship but live using submarines and talking insanely around the table. It can be really, really, really good, so I just haven't had the heart to get rid of it um, because I think when you do table it and it works well, it's really, really fun. And then Picture Perfect here is one that I've played recently. I may eventually get rid of this or gift it to my sister. It's not typically the kind of game that I would play, um, but I think it's a fun one to teach people who like deduction and kind of a spatial puzzle, and they like the idea. I have like the acrylic standees for it so it looks really really pretty and this is uh, my special spot where I have all of my 
RPG stuff. I've got a couple books spread out across the house, but I've got ooh, Blades in the Dark, which I can't wait to get to because I love stealth and um, intrigue kind of stuff. So really would like to jump into Blades in the Dark. I think it'd be a fun one. Might try and see if I can rope Jesse and Shira into doing that with me and Amber at some point. But I've got all of the Free League stuff. I've got the Alien, which I think is my favorite RPG I've ever done, is the Alien one. And then from them, they also have these starter sets, which really can get you into playing without having to do any of the setup work of being either the DM or the GM or being the characters. It gives you preset characters and all that stuff. And then most recently, they've just come out with the One Ring, which is based in the Lord of the Rings world. And so, you know, they've got really nice, like, GM screens and stuff that have all of the different um, rules that you might need to remember. So I really love Free League. I think they do an absolutely fantastic job in both production and also world building. Absolutely my favorite. I've got this beastly, beastly deluxe Scrabble board, which is on, like, a Lazy Susan. So it can rotate, and it's also got, like, the inset pieces to where the pieces don't move when you spin it around. This is, if I'm just with a family or friends and I want to like have, you know, some snacks and some drinks late at, or, you know, at night once the kids are down, this is such a satisfying thing to pull out and just play Scrabble. And I've got a chessboard here that I don't use very much, but yeah, let's keep going. Most recently got Libertalia. I have played this both solo and at a high player count, and I thought it was pretty slow at a high player count. It was fun and it was chaotic, but I think it was a little tad too long at five players. It's actually got some interesting things going on at solo and at two player because they have this different puzzle for two player with like a midshipman tile. And then at one player, they've got an, an, an AI system with the Automa that Stonemaier does that works pretty well. Unsure if I'll keep this long term. Reavers of Midgard, I just really enjoyed this kind of Viking, you know, worker placement card management style game. Or card action, not really card management. But I haven't played it in a while since I lived in Texas, so I just haven't gotten rid of it because I haven't... I feel like I need to play it again before I make a decision on getting rid of it. And I got Letters from Whitechapel, which was my first introduction to hidden movement games, which I love. I've got my management over there. And I haven't gotten rid of it because I really enjoyed it all the times I played it. There was stuff that I feel like I never added in the auto balancing stuff with either Jack or the police, but I, it's, it's like a nostalgia thing for me. And also I feel like, again, I would want to play it before getting rid of it. I've got dead of winter here, which I have been toying with getting rid of because it's, you know, semi cooperative hidden trader potential that just, it feels so brutal for a game that can take over two hours Apparently there's some ways you can play it which mitigate it that I've heard recently, but I've just been toying about getting rid of it for quite a while. I've got Zombie Dice that I play with my son a lot, another one that I probably would have gotten rid of if it didn't have an 8-year-old. I've got some playing cards behind there. I've got Tranquility, with which Alex taught me, and this is his extra copy that he gave me. So I enjoyed it. It was a relaxing one. I haven't gotten rid of it yet. Um, Secret Hitler, which I just bought not too long ago. Um, when the world started opening up again, and kind of like Deception and Captain Sonar, you really need a bigger size group to play it. But I've had really good experiences when I did this with my family at Thanksgiving. And then under here, I've got Badland Wolves, which is probably to date the fastest Kickstarter campaign and fulfillment I've ever experienced. So this is by Daniel Gorash, who I learned about through Jesse because he featured him, uh, a fellow Kentuckian, I believe. And I haven't played this yet because... I don't know why, I just haven't played it. I should play it because I have a group now that's sizable enough to where I could play this and experience what it's like. And then underneath there I have Barrage, which is the beefiest Euro in my collection that I haven't played yet. I haven't touched it yet at all. And then if you move down, oh my goodness, I've got some kids' table board gaming. I've got Fossilus and Creature Comforts, both, both of which are very interesting for their own reasons. Fossilus has this really cool spatial element where you're moving and shifting tiles that kind of are a dig site, archeological dig site, and they've got little fossil pieces that you pick out of inset holes in the plastic tray with tweezers. So that's really satisfying from a mechanical standpoint. And then Creature Comforts is um, kind of like a maybe, people liken it to Everdell. I don't really think it's like Everdell, 
but it's got a lot of like worker placement and tableau building, which can be satisfying. And then the, this is the, the family-friendly imprint of Burnt Island Games, who are one of my favorite um, strategy-heavy, crunchy publishers out there. And then I've got X-Wings, which I have not played yet. I got this because I knew that I would love either X-Wing or Armada, but I still have not played this one, even though I should, because I know I would enjoy it. I just haven't done it yet. And this is kind of a you know, a leftover from Fantasy Flight days where I just haven't done it yet, but I should play it. And then I've got Marvel United the Spider-Verse and Marvel United the Base, and somewhere I think over in here I've got the X-Men version of it. I got all those on sale from Amazon, and I was like, you know what? I'm paying essentially what I would typically pay for the base game to get all three of these. And then there's Sorcerer City here from Druid City. This is the nice deluxe edition. It's got really hefty metal coins. I played this solo, haven't yet played it with a group, but I really enjoyed it solo, so I kept it. Down here I have my um, beginning of my campaign regret sadness because I haven't started these yet. I've played like 20 hours plus of Gloomhaven on the digital Steam version, but I haven't, and I even have a massive, awesome organizer inside here. So I have paid money for the game, I have paid money for an organizer. I've paid money for the Jaws of the Lion. I've paid money for the Forgotten Circles. I've paid money for the digital version. And I still haven't played it yet. But I mean, like, look at this awesome organizational system that this has got set up. Like, let me see if I can get that out of there. But yeah, like, I've got really nice organizer that I, I think it's Gaming Trunk is the name of it. But the reason why I picked that one out of all the others is because it had a really good system for organizing the monsters. And I, I don't know why I haven't played this yet. I actually do know why I haven't played this yet. Because I want a table to leave it set up on. And I don't have a board game table. Jesse, I don't have a board game table to leave this set up on. You want to fix that at some point? But no, it's okay. I'll fix it myself. I'll fix it myself. And I've got Jaws of the Lion because I thought Jaws of the Lion could get my wife or someone into the game. And then they'd do the big one with me. So... And none of it makes sense, but that's why I have all of that. And then I've got Vagrant Song here, which I picked up at Gen Con. And I've played some of that. Kyle Rowan taught it to me, but I just haven't played it yet here. But again, some of these I just want to leave out. And then I've got all of these, which currently don't have a home. And that's because these are ones that I've been porting back and forth between here and the studio. So I've got God Tier with the different hero packs and the base game. And I haven't jumped into those yet. I've done an unboxing on those, which just hasn't gone up yet. I've got Burn Cycle from Chip Theory Games, which I've really enjoyed. And I've done quite a bit of content for. And it's just beautifully organized. Like, everything in here can be taken out and then used. Let me see if I can pull it out. Yeah, everything can be taken in and used out as, like, storage on the board when you're playing. Really well organized. And I can't wait to check it out. Box fart. More of that. And then I've got the biggest box. I'm going to like make my back go out. I've got the biggest box here for Assassin's Creed. This one's gorgeous. It's got so much stuff that is really, really pretty. You've got kind of all of the different tiles. I haven't punched them out yet. I did an unboxing, but again, I don't think I've edited that yet. Whoopsie. So, I'm, you know, all the tiles that go along with that. I'm a big fan of the Assassin's Creed video game series, so I really wanted to check this one out. And then, like I said, oh dear, the rest of these are all in here. I've got another one from Horrible Guild, the Railroad Ink Collection. I've been playing quite a lot of this, to be honest. I've been moving through here and even opening up some of the mini expansions. I love it. It's one of my favorite rolling rights I've played. And then I've got the X-Men Marvel United, Star Realms Frontiers, and Scope Stalingrad are two that I need to jump into. And as I mentioned, I've got the 1400 Chronicles of Crime, which I have been playing. And then underneath there, I've got Uprising, which has been an absolute blast to play. Really been enjoying that. So that's all the stuff that I have been recently moving to and from to do content on. And that brings us all the way to the Kallax. So this is the big boy that's got everything. I guess I can start off at the top with the stuff that doesn't fit in any of these, which is Tidal Blaze Deluxe. I have not played this yet. Um, I haven't played any of these three. 
This one I got at PAX Unplugged. There was someone selling it for a pretty good price, and I grabbed it because it's got it and the expansion inside of it. So I've grabbed Tidal Blades. Really want to jump into that. And then I kind of got to the point when all of the Kickstarter stuff started to really climb up in price that I was wondering... This is from Riot Games. I this is Mech versus Minions, and I'm gonna you know I'm gonna take this down and show you because it it deserves to be shown. It is a massive box, massive box, and this is only ninety dollars, which is absolutely mind-boggling to me given the prices that we pay on a lot of Kickstarters. That this was only ninety dollars, and I think it's because Riot Games just sells it at cost. But they have like these insane painted miniatures that look awesome, and I ended up buying this after doing Arcane, <laughs> not doing Arcane, but after, oh dear, after watching Arcane, which I absolutely adored that uh, TV show, I thought it was one of the best shows I've seen in a long time, but they've got, like, even just all of these, all of these are like washed miniatures, and then they've got this insane amount of stuff, they've got all these washed miniatures and those washed miniatures, and all of this is just $90 on their website. Like, I think it's still available. If you go online to Riot Games, you can get this for $90. And part of me just was uncertain how long that kind of a deal would last for such an insanely high production value. And also, I, I kind of realized watching Arcane, I don't need to know anything about League of Legends to appreciate the TV show. So I could also not need to know anything about the game to enjoy the board game. And then this was, there was a sale at my local game store. And this was much more discounted. Kind of closer or even a little bit less than what you can find it for online. And I was like, you know, what a good time to support them and also get a good deal on a game that I've wanted for quite a long time. This is what I feel like to be a much, a little bit more nuanced in the sense of what you're doing with ship upgrades. There's a lot more stuff going on than just the base units that you get in Twilight Imperium. And so also I know that this is supposed to take a shorter time frame. So I really am excited to try out Eclipse, but I need to find a half day in which I can play it with people. And that's just a little bit harder to find right now. But all three of these I'm excited to jump into. These are the big beefy Big beefy boys on top of the shelf. I guess I can just go this way, row on row. So there's Feast for Odin, which is a you know Ua Rosenberg game, and I haven't played the physical game yet. I'm currently on BGA, learning and playing a asynchronous game to kind of get into it, to where when I jump into the rule book, which is over there, I can learn the game faster. And so I've been enjoying just fumbling my way through it on Board Game Arena. Then I've got the two collector's editions for Raiders of the North Sea, Paladins of the West Kingdom. I kind of like all of the games from Shem Phillips that I've done, but I only really need one per series. And so I picked Raiders for North Sea, and I like the two expansions that are on there, Feasts, Fields of Fame, and Hall of Hero, I think. And then I've got the Paladins of the West Kingdom with the one expansion so far, the City of Crowns, I think. So I've got those two there. Then I've got Abomination, which I purchased recently because it's another plaid hat game. And I know that there were quite a few people that complained about this game in that maybe it took too long or that it was really arbitrary at the end of the game. But then I saw the Dice Tower top 10 with uh, Trey Parker from South Park. And he talked about the designer of the game came out with a shortened or streamlined version of it that he did new rules for. And that way is great. And so I want to get those rules and try this. Cry Havoc was just an acquisition from a trade uh, like a year ago. And I haven't played it yet. Western Legends. I know it's opened, not opened. Um, but I have played it up in Cleveland. I just haven't opened it yet. And I'm uncertain how I'll feel about that. But I do have Gia as well, which is another sandbox game. And I think I might like that one more. This is unsettled. I have not played it yet. All four of the expansion planets are unopened, but I do have the two in the center, the core box unopened. This was a full pledge that I bought at, I think, Gen Con, and I'm really excited to play it. Everybody I know who I play games with, like in Cleveland and other places, say that it's awesome. I just haven't played it yet. Then we're kind of moving over into games that I keep for somewhat solo purposes. These are just some game trays. 
uh, you know, component holders. But this is Imperium Classics and Legends. I haven't played either of these yet, but Alex was getting rid of them, and so I traded or asked him for it. And he, I'm excited to try this out because I've heard really good things about the design of these factions and how it functions. And then I have Veil Wraith, which is an egregiously large box for a very small amount of cards. There is an expansion that I feel like I could get, but I just haven't tried to get it yet. But I really actually like this. This is a super smooth, plain, beautifully art, art, artistically illustrated game. I like it a lot. Plays really well solo. Um, but the box is so big, it makes me hard to even justify having it, which is a whole other thing. Then we move over to games, which I've played about half of these. I've played Black Sonata, really enjoy it. It's, you know, you're trying to deduce the identity of the Dark Lady, Shakespeare's um, woman who he, you know, had a relationship with. And then McKee is by the same people, and it's like a worker placement game, which I think Jesse's played this and a couple other people I know, but I haven't played it yet. I really want to. Unbroken is a game that I have like a special attachment to because I haven't even played it yet. But I know that it did not have a good experience on Kickstarter because of Golden Bell. But I just have watched over the last like two years as the designer Artem Safarov has, of his own like intention, had all the games. And every time I just hear him being like, hey, you know, I've sent out these amount. And he's just sending out games and shipping them one at a time from his own pocket until he can fulfill all of them. Because there's still some people who haven't had it fulfilled. So I got this off of Amazon and then I've actually sent him money simply to help him ship because I think he's a stand-up guy. I think he's one of the nicest people I've seen who just has had a bad, a bad go of it because of not circumstances under his control. So I really want to play that. I've played Friday and I won on the easy mode and I haven't played it since then, but I, I liked it. it. I don't know if it's something that'll stay. I know that it's one that a lot of people like. I, I thought it was fun. Um, I don't know if it'll have lasting power. Tiny Epic Galaxies, also by Scott Alms, who did So You've Been Eaten, and also Warp's Edge. I haven't played this one yet, but I've heard that a lot of people like it solo, so I grabbed it. Uh, Coup is one that I uh, recently... Uh, I've had this for a very, very long time. I recently pulled it out to try and play, but we didn't end up having time. I love bluffing games, strategy games, so I grabbed that. The Crew is a cooperative trick-taking. I love trick-taking, but it's very hard to ever find people to play Spades and Hearts because you have to have four people, and you have to have them... You kind of want them evenly matched, but... So I have that. This is a very special box from One Sharp Joe Crafts, which he was very kind to custom make based off of a des existing design, and this holds my copy of Space Hulk, Death Angel, and all of the expansions. And so I've got the base game here all sleeved, and then I've got the ex four expansions, which can be hard to get. Um, this is a deceptively expensive game in what I have right here, but I really enjoyed it. I played it one time or one and a half times on a live stream, and I loved it. I had a blast, and so... This is from one of my favorite designers, Corey Konitsky. I'm excited to jump back into that. And then I've got Warp's Edge, which I just recently played twice to learn it. Once as a learning game, once to keep going. I beat the lowest difficulty. Excited to jump back in. Under Falling Skies, which I know those get compared quite a bit. I haven't played Under Falling Skies yet. My plan is too soon. <sighs> Moving down, we've got Shobu here, which I really like. This is from um, Smirk and Laughter. This is a good abstract game. Love this. I first learned about this when Alex and Jesse talked about Shobu and Talk, and I really enjoyed this. Blitzkrieg, as I said, Paolo Mori, really good abstract war, um, you know, kind of chip bag building experience. Really, really satisfying. Awesome two-player game. Moonrakers and Failed Fate. This is my love shout out to Ivy Studios. I've got Mythic Mischief on the way. I got to do lore for Veiled Fate, and this is one of their metal pledges, which I'm really excited to get to the table. Personally, I've played it up in Cleveland and at conventions. Really excited. I got to work on this and absolutely love the game. Moonrakers, I've filmed quite a bit of content on as well and really enjoy the social deduction. So love both of these games a lot, and I've done quite a bit of coverage or content on them. Over here, you've got Res Arcana, which has one of the expansions inside the box, and I recently picked up this when it was on sale, I think the same time I picked up Abomination. Haven't played this yet, but I know a lot of people love it, and I've heard that the expansions are both good in what they add to it, so I'm excited to table this 
And then I've got Escape the Dark Sector and Escape the Dark Castle. These are both from Themeborn, who have this really beautiful art style that they do. And I love the monochromatic black and white. Really easy to table, like 30 minute games that can be fun for, you know, just one person, fun for two people. Elder Sign and Bloodborne are two of the oldest games I have in my collection outside of some of the classics like um, Lords of Waterdeep. This is a dice rolling game from Fantasy Flight. I don't have any of the expansions for it. This is just the base game, but I enjoy it quite a bit. But I haven't played it in a long time, so I might have soured on it if I play it again soon. So this could potentially leave if I get to the point where I don't like it, or maybe I switch over to Arkham Horror, the card game, and I feel like I don't need this. Bloodborne, the card game, I have... I, I love Bloodborne, the um, you know the IP from the PS4, for, from software. I really love it, and this has the expansion in it as well. And it's just a very satisfying game to play. It's semi-cooperative. You're trying to kill monsters together, but you also want to be the person with the most blood echoes at the end of the game. So really enjoy this, but I haven't played it in a while. I'm curious to see how I'll think about it, but I, I've had a, always had a good time with it. <laughs> And then we've got Cover Your Assets, which is a new purchase that I haven't, I haven't played, and Monikers, which I got on the recommendation of Max from Table Knots, and I had a good time with it. I thought it was a fun little party game. No Thanks, which I have gotten that on the suggestion of Kim Brebach from Good Games Publishing. It's one of the ones he likes to teach people. And it's a little good, uh, like, you know, reasoning, delay judgment game on when you should take negative points because the whole thing is you're taking points which are not good and you want the lowest tally at the end of the game but you have counters which are the only way to say no to them so i like this game a lot crew mission deep sea i have not played it yet i just grabbed it when it was on sale because i haven't even made it through all the missions of the original crew Ganshan clever i got taught this by alex and i think this is his copy that he sent me and then he's also given me this um, travel version of Talk, which I haven't played yet, but I enjoyed. And you can play it on any version of a, a chessboard. And then Manus Falls, which I got at PAX Unplugged and haven't played yet, but I know that Quackalope has done coverage and several other people have too. And I like social deduction and, you know, plotting out strategy games. So I'm, I'm excited to check into that. Fleet the Dice game I have not played yet but I grabbed at the same time that I grabbed kind of quite a few other of these small box games. This is Set of Watch and then the Swords of the Coin expansion. Set of Watch is actually the first game that I ever reviewed when I was doing written reviews for Game Tyrant. So Rock Manor kind of has a little special place in my heart because he was the first person to give me a chance on doing content. Innovation, I just grabbed this. I, it, I know it's unopened, but I played this. Uh, Thinker Themer taught me this game at... Uh, Gamma, and I had an absolute blast when we played it at one of the kind of board game bars or brew houses there. Abstract Academy, I also got at Gamma um, from Crafty Games, and I haven't played it yet, um, but I, I got a demo of it when I was at Gamma. And then I picked up Regicide recently, but haven't played it yet. Uh, I've said I haven't played it yet so many times, and I'm not really used to doing that, but I haven't played quite a few of these. And then Sprawlopolis is one that Alex uh, gave me an extra copy of his to try it out. And this is the only button shy I have in my collection, and I'm excited to try it out. This whole thing is Final Girl. Not a lot needs to be said, or a lot could be said, because I really enjoy Final Girl. I've played through the Camp Happy Trails, and I'm excited to check out these other um, locations and bosses. It's absolutely gorgeous. I love the aesthetic of it. I love the artwork. I love the production value of everything that's going on. I fully backed the second season of this. Can't wait for the cassette larger boxes to house all of it um, because the modular thing does spatially bother me a little bit, but I love the idea of having two full sets with all of these different enemies and um, you know villains and locations. Really, really like this game. Then over here, I've got Lords of Waterdeep, which is one of the oldest games I still have from when I first started collecting. I love worker placement games. This is a classic. I've played it a lot on the app that I have on my phone, and I haven't tabled it physically in a while, but I've got like the broken token organizer to keep all of it nice and secure. Townsfolk Tussle was a recent uh, acquisition that the people who gave it to me all were aware that they gave it to me. Yeah, excited to play it. Uh, and then Bushido is one that... 
Bushido is one that I, I'm a little bit, uh, it kind of same reason for Veil Wrath. It's a huge box, and I'm not sure if the experience that I've had with it justifies the size of its place in my collection. But it does have an, it does have an expansion that's like a rage-based expansion, and I kind of like what it was doing. It's a very taut, fast-playing card action combat game, and I just haven't gotten rid of it because I kind of liked it more than I thought I would. I don't know if it's one going to be one of those like guilty pleasures. Most people don't like it, but I do, so I keep it in my collection. But I kind of want to get a hold of the expansion to see what that does. And then moving on to this one, I've got Canvas and Canvas Reflections, you know, the base game, and then the expansion that nicely fit next to each other. I love the artwork continuation on the covers there. And then, you know, you can hang this on the wall. I was taught this when I played up in Cleveland with uh, Jesse and Sheer and Alex. And I was surprised by Canvas. It's not a game that I would instinctively think, I want this. But I played it, and I had a really good time playing it. And so I wanted to get the game, and I backed it whenever the expansion came out. Dinosaur Island Roar and Right. I haven't played it yet, but I just I played Dinosaur World and it was such a table hog and it took a while and I kind of I didn't think it justified the the amount of investment that I had to put into it time and energy wise in in what I got out of it. And so I was like, well, I was like I know Dinosaur Island, but maybe I'll feel the same way about that. So if I try the Roar and Right, maybe that will encapsulate some of that experience in a different way and less less of a table bloat and time sink for me. And then I've got Unfair, which with one of the expansions, I've backed the other expansion that's out on Kickstarter. Really enjoy this. I, Amber and I have a fun time playing this at two players. I, I actually got rid of my copy of Funfair because with some of the Game Changer cards in here, you can kind of create the same experience of Funfair within Unfair. And this has so much more legs to go with all of the expansions that they plan for it. So this was the one that made sense for me to keep. Then I've got Tapestry with both expansions. I know that this is not a Stonemaier Games that a lot of people love, but Amber and I really, really enjoy playing this at two player. She kicks my butt at it every time. She's so much better at games like this than I am. But yeah, so she plays she plays this really and, and enjoys playing it a lot. So stuff like Unfair and Tapestry are easy keeps for me because Amber enjoys them and I like them too. And I think both of those expansions add quite a bit of complexity and lo like longevity to the experience of Tapestry. Then, oh, let's see. Change up my sitting pace. I just recently got bus. I spent about $100 on this, which is I think a good deal because I think Capstone sold it for like 80 85 back when they had it in stock and it's not in stock anymore you can't really get it and so I pretty much paid what I would have plus the shipping to get this so I was happy to acquire this before I stopped acquiring games and then Need of Valir this has the expansion in it as well I really enjoyed learning this on Board Game Arena and I like games like this I haven't I've played quite a bit of it online, but I have not tabled my copy of it here. I'm excited to see what the expansion does. In Too Deep and In the Hall of the Mountain King are from Burnt Island, which, as I said, they have the KTBG games over there. In Too Deep is my favorite game from them. I've got the deluxe stuff in here with the nice, you know, shiny foil. But I've got all of these miniatures, uh, which look pretty cool. There's a guy on Facebook, his name is Ken French, who does a lot of artwork on these, and his look really good. But I love all the miniatures for this. This is a super interesting spatial puzzler where you're trying to complete, like you're trying to fulfill the requirements of certain story missions by having people and items on certain locations. And I like it a lot. And In the Hall of the Mountain King is like the first one that they did. And I've backed Fall of the Mountain King. And I like this one a lot too. That's a polyomino, like cave dweller. Or not cave dweller, but like tunnel building one there. Then you've got Euphoria, which I think is the Stonemeyer game that everybody sleeps on. It's such a good worker placement game or dice placement. And thematically, I think it's fantastic. You, you never want your dice, your workers, if they're higher 
it means that they're like more intelligent, but you, you, all, you never really want them to be more intelligent. They can get more done for you, but then you have the chance of losing them because the more intelligent they are, the more they realize they're in a dystopia. So th the thematic and mechanical integrations of this game are just awesome. I have the Ignorance is Bliss um, expansion in here as well. I think it's a really good game, and I don't think enough people talk about it. And then I have Red Rising, which I know was kind of hot and cold for a lot of people, but I have read the books, and I love the books a lot. And knowing the books makes the game a lot better, in my opinion, because you understand all of the connections between the cards. So to me, it's a much better game because I know what all of the stuff means. Then I've got Rolling Realms here, which I may eventually get rid of. I may run through the mini golf of it. I think the mini golf is cool, the solo mode. It's not a game I would play not solo because it's just not interesting to me with play with other people because you don't really chat at all. You're kind of all focused on your own stuff that's going on. But once I play through it solo, I'll probably get rid of it. I've got some uh, from, you know, chai or steeped games, you know, chai tea. I've got some of their rollers there. I've also, I got these off of uh, Etsy, these nice little components things. That they're not magnetized or anything or connect to each other like the Wormwood ones, but they're very nice and I like them. And then I've got Scythe here. Scythe, the base game with a nice organizer from Broken Token. And then I've got the Rise of Fenders campaign, which I've been told by several people is one of the best campaign experiences that those people have played. So I'm excited to try it out. And I've got the modular board and the expansion for the encounter deck there. And that brings us to oh, all of the big games that take place down here. I've got Twilight Imperium 4th Edition because I absolutely love Twilight Imperium. And actually somebody sent me the Prophecy of Kings expansion from the board game Spotlight Dirty Santa or, you know, Secret Santa Exchange. So that was crazy to get this in a Secret Santa Exchange. But I love this game so much, and I am absolutely convinced that one day I will have Jesse and Shira and Alex play with me at some point. One of these days they'll play, and they'll realize they're wrong. They will realize they're wrong, and it's amazing. And then I've got Forbidden Stars here, but I'll talk about mind management first. This is the deluxe copy. This is kind of, to me, the evolution of my enjoyment and experience with hidden movement games. I did, you know, letters from Whitechapel over here, but this is the deluxe copy of the game, and it is gorgeous. Just what Matt Kent did on the artwork for everything, and like this is the shift package that you open when each side loses, and whichever side you are, you'll open that side and you'll get new abilities and stuff like that, but just the artwork is insane. I love the production value. Everything about this game just makes me smile when I play it. It's so much fun. And I was really blessed to have Jay send me that to review, which I felt awesome about. Maybe I should save it for the end, but this is kind of like one of my favorite games ever. And I've had it for a long time. And only recently did I buy some stuff to upgrade it. This is an out-of-print game, Warhammer 40k license, back when Fantasy Flight had it. This is from James Niffen, Samuel Bailey, and Corey Kaninskia. I have... This is... This is probably the game I went to the most level to upgrade. I went and I uh, laminated these myself to make sure they stayed good shape. I most recently just purchased foam stuff to take care of all of these. These are all of the ships and for the orcs and for the Eldar and for and then you know I've got the Chaos Space Marines and the Ultramarines in there. And then I, I even got to the point where these are the order tokens, which you do like hidden order token movement on the board. But if they ever get scuffed, the plastic versions of the, or the cardboard versions of them, you kind of can know what they are, which defeats the purpose of it being a hidden placement. So I ordered these off of Etsy, which are like nice plastic pieces that are not going to degrade. And then to protect all of the rest of the cardboard pieces, I got these rubber uh, edge protectors. And then, of course, it's all sleeved. <coughs> oh, my goodness. I'm talking so much. I'm coughing. But, yeah. So, I put a lot of effort. I, I, I protected this game so much that it's one of the only games I don't care that it's got an absurd box lift. Absolutely absurd. I mean, it's like almost doubled the height of the game because of how how high all that is. But I don't care because I love this game so much. 
Oh, I love Forbidden Stars. It's so good. People should play it. People should care about it. And then I've got Anachrony and the Essential Edition, uh, or the expansion for it. I really, really like this. I played it once. I taught it to myself, and I want to play it with more people. It's kind of one of those games, though, like Lacerda games or other really dense ones. I really want to play it with just people that know how to play. I don't really want to have to teach it. But it's from Mind Clash, and they make beautiful games. Then I've got Rebellion and Rise of the Empire, which I love. This is one of my favorite two-player games of all time. And I haven't even included the Rise of the Empire expansion. This was a somewhat recent one. But I also bought uh, that insert that I have for Forbidden Stars is like the Feld Her Foam insert. And I also grabbed it for Rebellion because this game I like a lot as well. And so I have... All of the people beautifully organized. And the reason why I did this is because typically, in true Fantasy Flight style, they are all bagged in these horrible bags. And so I have these foam here, which allows me, I could just leave these on the table and you could just get the people as you want them. And so I've once again paid quite a bit of extra money to protect another Fantasy Flight game that was poorly organized to begin with, but it's one of the ones that I love the most. It's such a good two-player game, and if you have two people who know the game, you could probably get the timeline of it down quite a bit, but I really, really love Rebellion. It's it's an absolute joy when I'm able to play it. I had some really good experiences with it and Forbidden Stars and Twilight Imperium. Then I've got Cloudspire from Chip Three Games. I think that this is the one of the three Chip Three games that I would enjoy the most if I spent the time to remember the rules. It, I, I'm actually planning before Origins to sit down at some point in the next week and play this game and reteach it to myself. I've got the update pack here that is going to update some of the faction sheets and cards and rules. And then, yeah, I want to jump back into it because I really do think it's the one of the three that I've played out of Too Many Bones, Cloud Spire, and Burn Cycle that I think would be my favorite. I've got Bloodborne here, but I'll talk about that when I get to that. And then I've got the Year of the Moloch. I actually, curiously enough, th there's not many people that I buy games because they tell me to. And I don't even watch the Dice Tower that much. But for some reason, every time Z Garcia talks about this game, his excitement for it just makes me want to do it. So I, I bought this game, and I haven't played it yet, but I really am excited about it. And this is like the collector's edition that has space for a lot of extra stuff but also has nicer components. And then you've got Brass Birmingham, which is, I had Brass Birmingham and Brass Lancashire, and I eventually got rid of Black Brass Lancashire because I didn't think I needed both of them in the same house. And so I kept Brass Birmingham because it was my favorite. And it's a really, really good Euro. I love it a lot. I don't know if I'd ever play it. I feel like four drags a little bit, but three was, three was good. That brings me to Dune Imperium. Dune Imperium I love so much that I have no intention of ever trying to play Lost Ruins of Arnak because everybody compares them and I just feel like I'm going to like this one more. But I like it so much that I got the expansion for it, which is in here. I haven't played with the expansion yet, but I also got the deluxe uh, you know, setup for it that's got all of these nice miniatures, it's got the nice wooden token, it's got all of these extra pieces that are represented by just cardboard in the original game. And they've got really nice chonky, nice chonky pieces. Really nice chonky pieces. And so that's what I've got for Dune Imperium. I love this game. The worker placement and deck building combo is so satisfying. I think people who really like deck builders are very dissatisfied with the deck building in here. They think it's too shallow. But I think it's the perfect amount because it flows really well with the worker placement. I love Dune Imperium. I think Dune Imperium, Dwellings of Eldervale, those are two of my absolute favorites from the last couple years. Including favorites from the last couple years, this is Chronicles of Drunagor and the ugh, Spoils of War box that came with the Kickstarter. I have backed the expansion for this that's also got the update pack for the game because I think this has the potential to be one of my favorite dungeon crawl campaign experiences, period. They've got some really cool mechanical stuff going on in the design here with their action cube system where you slot where you want to go and what type of action you want to do but then as the 
as the mission or as the adventure goes on, you add these curse cubes which block spots. And so you start off being so powerful and able to do pretty much anything you want. And as the mission goes on, you become very much more narrow in the choices you have to make. And so it's really much more like, oh, which one do I have the ability to cover up? And is that going to really make me regret covering up that particular ability later when I have so few choices? That brings us to board Bloodborne, the board game, which I haven't jumped into the Chalice Dungeon or some of the expansions. I've been playing the base game. And once again, like Gloomhaven, I played a little bit of this, though. I haven't played Gloomhaven on the physical copy. But I kind of stopped playing this after a few sessions because it was a game that to, just took me too much effort to get in and out of the box and do it again and again on my dining table. And I really want to wait until I have a gaming table that I can keep it set up at to push through, you know, over the course of a few weeks, continue to play and finish, you know, a lot of the campaign. Then I've got War of the Ring and Geo, which these are two big experiences that I have not played yet. War of the Ring I got because a lot of people, you know, liken it to the experience of Star Wars Rebellion, which I haven't, I haven't, I just haven't played this yet because I need a whole day to do it. And I haven't done it yet, but I've got some expansions that I got as gifts. My brother, I think I bought one when it was on sale, and my brother bought me another one. And then I've got Gia Legends of Adrift System with the expansion, the Embers of a Forsaken Star. I know that the people up in Cleveland, Jesse and Sheer and Alex, have all played this and had a good time with it. And so I'm excited to try it. And I think I'm hoping to play it the next time I'm up. Which brings us to the last two. I've got Black Rose Wars here with the Kronos, or Chrono, Chrono expansion here. I haven't played the Chrono expansion, but I taught this to the crew up in Cleveland, and I had a blast. I loved it. I know that it can be a shaky teach and learn experience if you don't have the player aids, but I absolutely loved slinging spells at each other, redirecting them, setting traps. The card combinations, because of all of the cards that they have across all the different schools of magic, there's so many options that you could have in a game of this, and I really, really, really enjoyed it. So this isn't going anywhere anytime soon. I actually sold my Seder box to encourage me to not be scared by all of the stuff for it and to play it more often. So I'm going to be trying to schedule some game days here in the next few months for big experiences like that. And then that brings us to the thing that is probably the most visually appealing. It is the Trove Chest for Too Many Bones, which unlike my friend Jesse, who I'm not going to talk about, I've actually organized mine with all of the stuff that I have. So I've got all of the different characters with their particular dice set up. I have got, I so I started off with, you know, the main four, um, Picket, Tantrum, Patches, and Boomer, and then Stanza and Duster came with the copy of Undertow that I got. And then there was someone online who was selling Gasket, Tink, Nugget, and Gilly all for like $75. And if you know CTG prices, I think they're normally like 30 each. So that was like 120 So I, I was able to talk them down from what I think it was originally because I said, you know, I had this trove chest. I didn't need the boxes for them. I said, just ship them all in an envelope. And because CTG is neoprene quality and dice is insane, I know that I'll be fine. But then I've also got all the tyrants all organized of the ones that I have. There's plenty of content for Too Many Bones I don't have, but I don't feel the need to buy it because I haven't played it enough to need new content. But I've got all of the gorgeous neoprene mats, everything nicely tucked away inside this very, very nice trove chest that I acquired all on my own and wasn't generously gifted by a duck benefactor. And that's my whole collection. I was supposed to stay there when I did that. Oh, can I just lay down now? Can I just lay down now? Those are all my board games. There's a lot of them. Does my chin look good from this angle? Does my chin look good? I've got a lot of board games. And maybe I'll play some of them now that I'm not buying games for like a year. Uh, that was a lot more talking than I thought it was going to be. Uh, it's just like, I don't know. I think I'm going to play most of them. 
I hope I do. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I really should play them because I bought all of them. Or I bought most of them. Some of them were, you know, review copies or gifts or trades or whatever, but I have a lot of games, so I should definitely... I should play them. I, that, I should play them. I mean, it's kind of like the idea of, like, if I bought movies, should I not, like... Should I not watch the movies? I mean, oh, Jesse, now that I'm looking at it, I forgot. <laughs> ah, I, for, I forgot the croconole board. I forgot the croconole board. I'm going to get up. I'm going to show you the croconole board. How can I forget the croconole board? This is a Tracy, Jeremy Tracy made croconole board from the croconole game boards they're amazing this is one of the favorite things i have in my whole collection i've got the bag of goodies over there with all the buttons and everything and the little 20 holders this is amazing i love this game if somebody comes over and they don't want to actually spend the time to play a big game i ask them if they want to play this because i i would play this over just about anything i have this is so good it's really really good i love this game it's a really good game i love Crokinole. I love Crokinole. It's so good. That's the last game that I was going to talk about, but I didn't remember that I was going to talk about it. And so, yeah, it's a really good game. I love this game. It's a, it's a great one. It's a really good game. That's my, that's my collection now. That's my collection now. Can we lie on the floor again? I would love to just lie on the floor again. Could we do that? 